In this chapter, we're going to start getting into the benefit of the law. Because you'd think if everyone gets saved the same way, Gentile people and Jewish people, well, why do the Jews even need the law, you know? <laughs> if you can get saved without it, what's the point of it? But it turns out there is a point and it has to be understood. Let's read. Then, what advantage does the Jew have? Or what profit is there in circumcision? Much in every way. Because, first of all, they were entrusted with the revelations of God. For what if some were without faith? Will their lack of faith nullify the faithfulness of God? May it never be. Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you might be justified in your words and might prevail when you come into judgment. But if our unrighteousness commends the righteousness of God, what will we say? Is God unrighteous who inflicts wrath? I speak like men do, may it never be. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God through my lie abandoned to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? Why not? as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let's do evil that good may come. Those who say so are justly condemned. What then, are we better than they? No, in no way. For we previously warned both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As is written, there is no one righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. They've all turned away. They have together become unprofitable. There is no one who does good. No, not so much as one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of vipers is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever things the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be brought under the judgment of God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, a righteousness of God has been revealed being testified by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all those who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent to be an atoning sacrifice through faith in his blood, for a demonstration of his righteousness through the passing over of prior sins in God's forbearance, to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, that he might himself be just and the justifier of him who has faith in Jesus. Where then is the boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, the law of faith. We maintain therefore that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, or is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since indeed there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be, no, we establish the law. And he's gonna go on in the next chapter or two to, to talk more about the importance of the law. But in just in this chapter, he says a few things about how the law is important. Because there were two main groups in Christianity at the time, the Jews and the Gentiles, and the Jews were all trying to keep the law, but also have faith. And the Gentiles were, were told officially in Acts chapter 15 that they didn't have to keep the law, but they just had to do these four things, which we've talked about quite a few times. Go and watch the Acts chapter 15 video for more clarity. But the Gentiles didn't have to keep circumcision, didn't have to keep the Sabbath. There was a bucket load of stuff they didn't have to do. They just had to love, the, there was four things they were gonna keep, keep doing, which, and, um, and love the Lord. <laughs> so it was really about love and faith. 
but the Jews had this history. And, um, but Paul makes the point in chapter 1 um, and chapter 2 that the Jews and the Gentiles, both of them, are under the wrath, wrath of God. And, um, and then we get to this point, he makes the point then of saying that if, if those who have the law are under God's wrath and those who don't have the law are under God's wrath, and if you can get saved without the law and being Jewish, and you can get saved without the law being Gentile, what's the point of even having a law at all? And this chapter says a few things about it. First of all, it says in where is it? <laughs> Uh, verse 19, sorry, it says that we know that whatever things the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be brought under the judgment of God. So the law is important for Jews because it silences the mouth. So the Jews can easily point a finger at other people and say you're not doing the right thing, but the law says to them you're doing the wrong thing. And uh, they have got no response to it. Um, I remember um, a friend at school who did something that he shouldn't have done and was called to the principal's office. And he didn't know that the principal knew, but the principal gives evidence of what has happened. And the student suddenly goes, oh, and just stops talking. <laughs> and the principal um, is wanting to discuss the matter, but the student has got nothing to say in their defense. Their mouth has been silenced. So the law has a role in silencing every mouth. So um, you, can't, you can't say that you're a good person when the law demonstrates you're not. And that's one of the most important things about the law is it demonstrates that we are not good. In the book of Romans, um, because salvation is the major theme, there are lots of verses in the book of Romans that are used in witnessing. For example, um, there is, uh, the, uh, where is it? We were just reading it. Verse 23 is a really good one. Verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Romans 3.23, that's a famous one. And there are, there are quite a few verses in the book of Romans like that. So you may have heard of this thing called the Roman road to salvation. Roman roads were like highways. Today, our highways are bitumen, cars drive on them. And uh, you can drive at quite a good speed in Australia. And I can, we can drive from here in Rockhampton to Brisbane in about seven to eight hours. And that's like 400 miles away or 600 kilometers away. And uh, we can drive from Rockhampton to Sydney in under a day if we if we put in a big effort or two days of an average effort either we can cover big distances on our highways well in Roman times their highways were paths they were built with stones and it's amazing how some of those highways are still there 2,000 years later they were really well built and um, so that was a Roman road was a way of getting one way to another well um, someone has put together this Roman road of salvation and they've used only verses from the book of Romans to show people how to become a Christian. And there's a series of verses. And so Romans 3, 9 in the chapter we've just read is the first verse. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Paul was using that point to say that the Greeks are not righteous or the Gentiles and the Jews are not righteous, no one's righteous. But in our way of thinking in modern times, we individualize it, we, we realize that I'm not righteous. You're not righteous, I'm not righteous, it becomes personal. In Romans 6, it said the wages of sin is death. So number one, you're not righteous. Number two, the result of you not being righteous is, you, there's wages for that, death. Romans 5, 8, the third verse, but God shows his love for sinners and that he died for them. So there's, you can, there's, this Roman road is a series of verses, all from Romans, showing you, number one, you're not righteous. Number two, there's a penalty for that. But number three, God loves you. Num Romans 10 verse nine, which is the fourth verse, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, you will be saved. 
That's the fourth verse. So salvation comes through confession and faith in Christ. Romans 5, 1, the fifth verse. Since we have been justified with God, we have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the sixth verse, Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So these verses in the proper order is called the Roman road to salvation. And if, if you don't know how to share your faith with someone, it's a very simple way to learn these six verses. And it's just a simple pattern to follow in sharing the gospel with someone who doesn't know it. All right. Dr. Creasy says, um, I, I've listened to a lot of him. I've read a lot of Bert Kaufman. There's a, there's a few commentators I read or listen to regularly. Um, Dr. Creasy says that the law is the straight line against which we measure our crookedness. <laughs> so we need a straight line with which to measure our crookedness. So the question is, why do we need a law? We need a law to, re to recognize that we are crooked. If you don't think there's anything wrong with you, you won't be saved. <laughs> you won't realize you need to be saved. And um, you know, there's, if, if you've got a terrible disease, but you don't know you've got the terrible disease, you won't bother trying to get the cure. So the law is the way of showing people they've got a terrible disease called sin. So um, we're going to carry on with Romans chapter 4. But the law, as it turned out, turns out is very, very important. And um, if you only have grace, but you don't have law, then you don't have salvation. People think that if you're saved by grace through faith, you don't need the law. But if you don't have the law, you don't have grace. Probably should just explain this before we pray. But if you have um, a law that says um, don't, don't hurt others, let's say there's a rule that says don't hurt others, or let's say in a class at school, there's a school rule that says don't call people names, don't bully. If you have a law that says that, and a student comes in and breaks that law, now they're in trouble. Now they deserve to be punished. Now, they, now there are consequences. But then the teacher can come along and if they notice that the student is sorry and they say, oh, I, I know I did the wrong thing. I really regret it. I wish I didn't. I'm sorry. Now you can give them grace because they know they've done the wrong thing and they're able to, to receive it. But let's say there's no law and there's only grace. Let's say there's just grace all the time. No matter what you do, there's just grace. A student comes in, bullies another student in this classroom scenario. As far as they're concerned, they haven't done anything wrong. And even if they had, it doesn't matter because they're going to get grace. So the situation doesn't work. You can't get saved in that situation where there's only grace because um, there's nothing to be saved from. Um, you're, still, you're still in a place of hardness of heart. You're still in your sin. You're still in your evil. There's no, report, there's no remorse. There's no repentance. Grace can only be given in a case where someone knows they've done something wrong. Otherwise, people are entitled and they think they can do whatever they want. So grace only exists if there's law. So the law is the line against which we measure our crookedness and the law is the thing that has to be in place, otherwise grace doesn't work. Father, I thank you for Romans. Lord, I wish I could explain it as good as Paul. Father, it's so obvious that Paul uh, is right up there, Lord, with the highest of IQs. And Lord, had the Holy Spirit, Lord, Father, I ask you would help us understand and to follow you in Jesus name. Amen.